Good evening and welcome. Tonight we're going to continue reading through the Atlas Obscura. So tonight we're going to read through the third chapter about Europe. We're going to cover Bulgaria, Croatia, the Czech Republic, Estonia, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, North Macedonia, Poland, Romania, Russia, Serbia, Slovakia, and Ukraine. I've hesitated doing this chapter because I was going to record it a couple weeks ago, but um, Russia invaded Ukraine that week, so I was kind of holding off on that, but this was requested, so I'll always take requests. If there's a series you really want to see me continue, just go ahead and leave a comment. I'll put it in the queue and um, start that one as soon as I can. But that being said, um, there is a lot going on in Ukraine at the moment that I'm filming this, so this video has nothing to do with politics in Russia or Ukraine, it's just um, strange and obscure places in those countries. So let's just dive right in. Let me find it. We left off way over here. Mm -hmm. And, my goodness, we've read a lot, haven't we? Let's see, here we go. We've read a lot in this already. So, starting off in Bulgaria, we'll be reading about Nest and Arts while fire dancing in Bulgari and Burgas. And apologies if I mispronounce anything, feel free to correct me in the comments. A tiny village tucked into the southeast corner of Bulgaria. Bulgaria is the only place in the country where Nest in Artsvo, an annual fire dancing ritual, is performed in its authentic form. The tradition is one in which dancers known as Nestinari dance barefoot on smoldering embers to encourage fertility and good health. Nestin Artsvo is an amalgam of pagan and Christian practices. Dancers, many of whom enter a trance-like state prior to the ritual, carry icons of the saints as they step onto the circle of embers. Surrounded by an audience of villagers, they walk back and forth to the beat of a drum, shouting prophecies over the sound of bagpipes. That's pretty awesome. Moving on to the Bujluja monument in Kazimlak, Stara Sakura. On a remote mountain in Bulgaria sits a smooth, gray, disc-shaped monument that wouldn't look out of place in a schlocky sci-fi film. A red star on the monolith beside it, however, reveals its true origins. In the 1970s, 6,000 workers spent seven years constructing the building as a tribute to communism. A compulsory donation from every Bulgarian citizen provided funding for the project. When the Bulgarian Communist Party surrendered its political monopoly in 1989, and Bulgaria began the transition toward democracy, the Bujluza site quickly lost its rele relevance. Vandals soon attacked the abandoned monument, destroying its interior artwork. The concrete structure remains, but a visit is more likely to inspire anti-communist sentiment than celebrate the wonder of socialism. A message painted in big red letters over the doorway reads, Forget your past. Isn't that interesting? I like how foreboding that looks. And then this big statue down here. Let's see. Next, we are heading off to Croatia. Just one stop. The Museum of Broken Relationships in Zagreb. When Croatian artists Solinka Vistica and Dracin Grubsicic four-year romance came to an end in 2003. The former couple joked that they would have to set up a museum to display all the objects they had shared. Three years later, they opened the Museum of Broken Relationships. The institution contains a fascinating gathering of former tokens of affection. Besides the standard teddy bears and letters, the collection also includes a tiny bottle filled with tears, an axe, air sickness bags, and a prosthetic leg. While some of the items are tragic, a woman used the axe to smash her ex-girlfriend's furniture. Some are sweet. 
the air sickness bags are from flights during a long distance relationship and the prosthetic leg came from a man who fell in love with his physical therapist. Now we're off to the Czech Republic to see the devil heads in Shalitsi. A disturbing sight awaits hikers exploring the forest above the village of Zhilitsi in Czechia. Looking out over the, um, that's a lot of accents, oh, Kokorzinsko Nature Reserve. Two enormous demonic faces carved from the native stone stare back with empty eyes. Created by renowned Czech sculptor Vaclav Levy in the mid-19th century, the nearly 30-foot-tall sandstone heads are known as Sertovi Slavi, or the Devil Heads. They have been a local attraction for generations. Now suffering slightly from the ravages of time and weather, the monstrous faces have grown less distinct over time, but no less creepy. Off to Estonia to see the Sarma crater field in Kali Sarma. Opinions vary on when it happened, but at some point between 5600 BCE and 600 BCE, a large meteor entered the atmosphere, broke into pieces, and slammed into the forest floor on the island of Sarma. The heat of the impact instantly incinerated trees within a three-mile radius. A mythology developed around the nine craters clustered in Sarma. Water gathered in the largest cavity, a 360-foot wide, 72-foot deep basin, now regarded as a sacred lake. Iron Age inhabitants built a stone wall around it, and the discovery of silver and animal bones during archaeological excavations in the 1970s suggests the lake was a site for animal sacrifice and pagan worship. Some of the site's animal remains were dated to the 1600s, long after the church forbade such rituals. The crater field now features a meteor museum, souvenir shop, and hotel offering a buffet breakfast and sauna. Sounds wonderful. Next is the Pottery Sea Fortress Prison in Tallinn, Harju. Harju, maybe, I'm not sure. Pottery, a sea fortress built in 1840, housed inmates in its cold, dark confines from 1919 until 2002. The prison has been left virtually untouched since it closed, right down to used cotton swabs in the operating room and pictures of women torn from magazines plastered on the wall cells. On the cell wall. Rusting wheelchairs, flaking paint, and dust-covered, neatly made beds provide a creepy atmosphere exceeded only by the musty, dimly lit hanging room. Pottery is available to rent for weddings and parties. I don't know about that. Parties, maybe. I'm not sure about weddings. Off to Hungary, to Memento Park in Budapest. When communism collapsed in Hungary in 1989, the city of Budapest was left with dozens of public monuments that celebrated the fallen regime. Rather than destroy these socialist relics, the city decided to banish them to the suburbs. Twenty minutes outside the Budapest city center, the Mento Park is the final resting place of more than 40 communist-era statues and plaques. The open-air park displays the outcast monuments in a neutral setting, neither making a mockery of them nor honoring them. Perhaps the most curious item, curious item in the park is a full-scale replica of Stalin's giant boots. A huge 26-foot statue of the Soviet leader once stood at Felvunolasi Square, apologize, in central Budapest, serving as a rallying point and parade route for the communist regime. On October 23, 1956, Hungarians revolted against the regime and pulled down the huge statue, leaving only Stalin's massive boots behind. Though the revolution was brutally crushed, the replica of the footwear now serves as a memorial to those lost in the uprising, and a reminder of life behind the Iron Curtain. Check that out. Look how it's falling apart. Right. Next, we're at the Holy Rite, also in Budapest. Stephen I, Hungary's first king, died in the 11th century, but a piece of him lives on in Budapest, his right hand. 
talk of healing miracles occurred at Stephen's tomb led to his canonization in 1083. The exhumation of the former king's body revealed an incorruptible right arm, incorruptible being the Catholic belief that divine intervention can prevent the posthumous decay of saintly bodies. Over the ensuing centuries, the king's detached arm passed through multiple countries and owners. During the 13th century Mongol invasion of Hungary, it was sent to Dubrovnik, Croatia, for safekeeping by the Dominican monks. It was probably at this time that the right hand, or holy right, was severed from the rest of the arm. Dividing saintly body parts was a common practice at the time. Portions of a relic were often sent to churches in neighboring countries in order to prevent squabbling and political unrest. Today, the holy rite, known to sacrilegious young Hungarians as the monkey paw, resides in an ornate golden reliquary in Budapest's Basilica of St. Stephen. Drawn into a tight fist and clutching precious jewels, the hand, now shrunken and yellowed, still manages to look strong and defiant. A brief stop in Latvia to see the Radio Astronomy Center in Irbeni, and spills. Haven't covered Latvia on my channel, so I have no idea how to pronounce Latvian things, so apologies for that as well. Until 1993, the 105-foot radio antenna in the remote forests of Irben was a top-secret piece of espionage equipment. Members of the Soviet military, who lived in a purpose-built housing complex nearby, used the dish to monitor communications between NATO countries during the Cold War. Following the restoration of Latvia's independence in 1991, Soviet troops gradually withdrew from the country. Before departing Urbana, soldiers took the time to attack the radio equipment, pouring acid into motors, cutting cables, and hurling pieces of metal into the antenna's mechanisms. Though severely damaged, the big dish, the eighth largest in the world, survived. In July 1994, the Latvian Academy of Sciences took over the site, spending three years conducting repairs and reconfiguring the antenna to operate as a radio telescope for astronomical studies. The Academy's Ventspils International Radio Astronomy Center division now uses the telescope to observe cosmic radiation and debris. Urbana's Soviet past is evident in its military ghost town collection of crumbling concrete blocks filled with the abandoned possessions of its former inhabitants. Next we're off to Lithuania. We're at the Hill of Crosses and um, Mesh Kuichai and Sholai. Shol, Sholai. Sholai? Sholai, I forgot. I think it's Sholai. Crosses have been accumulating on this small hill since the 14th century, when Teutonic Knights of the Holy Roman Empire occupied the nearby city of Sholai. New crosses tend to appear during periods of occupation or unrest as symbols of Lithuanian independence. This was particularly evident during a peasant uprising against Russian control in 1831, when people began placing crucifixes crucifixes in remembrance of missing and dead rebels. By 1895, there were 150 large crosses on the site. In 1940, the number had grown to 400. During the Soviet occupation, which lasted from 1944 to 1991, the Hill of Crosses was bulldozed three times. Each time, locals and pilgrims returned to put up more crosses. The site achieved worldwide fame when Pope John Paul II visited in 1993 to thank Lithuanians for their enduring symbol of faith. There are now approximately 100,000 crosses on the hill. The faithful are welcome to add their contribution in whatever form they wish. A crucifix made of Legos recently joined the collection. Check that out. That's so many crosses. Incredible. We're off to next. We're off to North Macedonia. And, hey Rooster. <laughs> you know, I was going to mention this in the video I just did on North Macedonia, but I wasn't sure how to pronounce it. And now that's coming back to bite me, isn't it? The Khrushchevo Macedonium? Uh, I assume it's in Khrushchevo. 
the Space Age spherical building on a hill overlooking the medieval town of Khrushchevos re resembles something between a Star Wars set piece and a giant virus. Neither of these remotely relates to the monument's solemn purpose to commemorate the 1903 Ilinden Uprising when a group of Macedonians revolted against the Ottoman Empire in an attempt to establish an autonomous state. 800 rebels took control of Khrushchevo on the night of August 2nd, renaming it the Khrushchevo Republic. The Khrushchevo Republic lasted 10 days before the Ottomans struck back. An 18,000 strong army stormed the town and quickly recaptured it, burning and plundering as they went. Despite the short life of the Khrushchevo Republic, Macedonians revere the leaders of the Ilinden Uprising, and August 2nd is a national holiday. The Macedonia Monument, built in 1973, is held in similar esteem, and it also appears on national currency. It contains stained glass skylights, a centerpiece that resembles an oversized glass burner, and the tomb of the uprising's leader, Nikola Karev. Off to Poland, and I'm terrified because I have no idea how to pronounce Polish anything, and I know I have a lot of Polish viewers, so forgive me. <laughs> Just correct me in the comments because I'm sure I'm going to mispronounce everything. El Blog Canal in Yolongi, I hope. Due to drastic changes in elevation, the El Blog Canal is broken up into short strips of water separated by stretches of land. In order to navigate this tricky waterway, an ingenious system of inclined planes was created to transform boats into railroad cars for the troublesome portions of the journey. Stretching from Lake Druzhno to Jorak Lake, the narrow course is the longest navigable canal in Poland, yet it was nearly unusable until the mid-1800s when the King of Prussia ordered a novel solution. As the canal is too long and steep to use traditional water locks, pairs of rail tracks are laid across the dry stretches. Giant water-powered cradles then lift the boats up out of the water place them on the tracks and carry them across the ground to the next bit of sailing territory. The unique amphibious canal has been hailed as one of Europe's most impressive engineering marvels. Next is the Wilichka salt mine in Wilichka, Lesser Poland. Miners at Wilichka carved its rock salt deposits without interruption from the 13th century until the 1990s. Over the centuries, workers slowly turned the seven-level subterranean mine into a majestic salt city replete with life-size rock salt sculptures of saints, biblical wall reliefs, and tableaus depicting their daily lives. In the early 1900s, the workers undertook their most ambitious project, an underground church named after Kinga, the patron saint of salt miners. The 331-foot-deep St. Kinga's Chapel features a sculpture of Christ on the cross, depictions of scenes from the New Testament, a wall relief of da Vinci's The Last Supper, and two altars. All are carved from salt. Hanging from the ceiling are five chandeliers that miners crafted by dissolving salt, removing its impurities, and reconstituting it into crystals as clear as glass. Another memorable site on the tour is the placid subterranean lake in the Josef Kluzhduski chamber, softly lit and overseen by a statue of St. Pan Nepomucin. Nep Nep Nepomucin? I'm, I'm, I have no idea. The patron saint of drowning. Take a moment of reflection before you bundle into a small dark miner's cage with five other people for the long ascent back to the surface. I told you I can't pronounce anything. Next is the Crooked Forest. It's in West Pomerania. I have no idea how to pronounce this. N Nova Sarnovo, I assume. At first, Graffino Forest looks to be a run-of-the-mill field of trees. And then you see it, a group of 400 pines, each with a mysterious dramatic bend close to the ground. Is that interesting? Trees' unusual but uniform J-shape is likely the result of human intervention. Probably farmers who manipulated the trees with the intention of turning them into curved furniture. The 
pines planted in 1930 had around 10 years of normal growth before being distorted. An alternative theory holds that regular flooding caused the unusual shapes. That's really beautiful. Next we're off to Nova Huta in Krakow. As Soviet occupying forces rolled into Poland toward the end of World War II, they found a country devastated by the ferocious fighting on the Eastern Front. Rebuilding was in order, and Moscow saw the opportunity not only to remake Poland's cities, but also to dramatically reshape Polish society while they were at it. To achieve this, the Soviets set to work planning and building Nova Huta, which was to be an ideal city, representing a vision of a glorious communist future. The project was approved in 1947, and construction of the Urban Equi Experiment in Social Engineering began in 1949. One of only two fully planned socialist realist cities ever built, the other being Magnitogorsk in Russia. Nova Huto is created as a bustling working class enclave. Built on the outskirts of Krakow for a population of 100,000, Nova Huto was laid out in a sunburst pattern radiating from a monumental central square called Plot Centralny and built in a stirring architectural style that combined Renaissance elegance with the grand, overwhelming scale typical of Soviet projects. Wide avenues were designed to halt the spread of fires. Trees lining those avenues were planted to absorb the impact of a nuclear blast. Most important was Nova Huta's intended status as a proletarian paradise. To that end, the city was built with a massive steel mill at one end because Nova Huta means new steel mill. The Lenin Steelworks contained the largest blast furnace in Europe and employed 40,000 people at its height, with the capacity to produce 7 million tons of steel annually. It was an odd location for such a facility, given weak local demand for steel, but in this case, as in many others during the Cold War, the symbolism was more important than the logic. Ironically, Nova Huta later turned into an anti-communist hub and was key in the solidarity movement of the 1980s. Nevertheless, the city remains to this day one of the best examples of socialist, realist architecture and urban planning. Next is the Photoplasticon in Warsaw, Masovia. Before movie theaters and motion pictures, the European public entertained itself with a visit to the Photoplasticon. Invented in Germany in the late 19th century, the Photoplasticon, or Kaiser Panorama, is a cylindrical wooden structure with, a multiple, with multiple viewfinders, through which people can view illuminated, stereoscopic photographs. In the first half of the 20th century, there were around 250 Photoplasticon devices across Europe. Visitors sat at one of the pairs of goggles and watched, spellbound, as seemingly three-dimensional scenes from around the globe paraded past. Images of African deserts, American cities, and Arctic expeditions. All the stuff of fantasy, the pre-cinema, pre-air travel era, provided an escapist thrill and broadened people's perceptions of the world. This Warsaw model, built in 1905, is one of only a few left that are still in working condition. It is equipped with 18 viewing stations and sits in the middle of a parlor plastered with old travel posters. Off to Romania. We're at the Mary Cemetery in Sapanza, Marmirish. At the Cimitural Vessel, or Mary Cemetery, over 600 colorful wooden crosses bear the life stories, dirty details, and final moments of the bodies that lie below. Displayed in bright, cheery pictures and annotated with limericks are the stories of almost everyone who has died in the town of Sapanza. Illustrated crosses depict soldiers being beheaded and a townsperson being hit by a truck. The epigraphs are surprisingly frank and often funny. Underneath this heavy cross lies my mother-in-law. Try not to wake her up, for if she comes back home, she'll bite my head off. The cemetery's unique style was created by a local named Stan Jan Patrosh, who at the age of 14 had already begun carving crosses for the graveyard. 
By 1935, Patras was carving clever and ironic poems done in a rough local dialect about the deceased, as well as painting their portraits on the crosses, often depicting the way in which they died. Patras died in 1977, having carved his own cross and leaving his house and business to his most talented apprentice, Dimitri Pop. Pop has spent the last three decades continuing the carving work has also turned the house into the Mary Cemetery's workshop museum. Despite the occasionally darkly comic or merely dark tones of the crosses, Pop says no one has ever complained about the work. Very interesting. Really beautiful too. Let's see what is next. Oh my. The August von Spies Museum of Hunting in Cebu. Glass-eyed animal heads cover the dimly lit walls of this museum, a stark reminder of Romania's appeal to hunters. The country's large bear population is due to the policies of the country's last communist leader, Nicolae Ceausescu, who, after depleting the bear population in his own private reserve, made bear hunting illegal for everyone but himself and a few hand-picked Communist Party members. The measure protected many bears from slaughter, but Ceausescu killed more than his fair share. Driven by a desire to hunt the biggest animals, he had bear cubs captured, fed a healthy diet, and then released back into the wild when they had fattened up. But the animals had grown so used to being fed by humans that they died hungry in the wild. Undeterred, Ceausescu switched methods, ordering that the bears be fed raw meat and beaten with sticks to discourage attachment resulting aggressive bears were known to attack hikers in cars. One of Ceausescu's largest trophies, the skin and stuffed paws of a huge brown bear, is on display at this museum. The bulk of the trophies, however, hail from the 1,000-strong personal collection of Colonel August von Spies, a fellow chaser of Carpathian bears and Romania's royal hunt master from the 1920s and 30s. dog was killed by the bear, apparently, so they're both together forever, apparently. And here we have the Turda salt mine in Turda Cluj. I assume. This former salt mine, excavated by hand and machine over hundreds of years, is now a subterranean fairground cum spa. Operational from the times of the Roman Empire until 1932, the mine closed for 60 years, reopening to the public in 1992. The microclimate, a steady 53 degrees Fahrenheit year-round, with high humidity and no allergens, is ideal for halotherapy, an alternative health treatment in which people with respiratory problems spend time breathing in the salt-infused air. The current attractions in the 260 by 130 foot space make it easy to pass the hours. They include a ferris wheel, mini golf course, bowling alley, and underground lake with paddle boats. To offset the darkness, bright lights hang vertically on strings from the 16th century ceiling, illuminating dripping stalactites with a blue-tinged glow. They have a fun time in their salt mines over here in this part of the world, don't they? Next, we're off to Russia. We're at Alexander Golod's Pyramids in Ostashkov. It's very blast. Aggression, osteoporosis, blackheads, dizziness, heartburn, depression, sterility, learning disabilities, arachnophobia. All these ailments and many more can be swiftly cured, according to Russian scientist and defense engineer Alexander Golod. The remedy is simple. Pyramids, obviously, right? Seizing upon a new age belief that pyramids exude healing energy, Golod had built, has built fiberglass pyramids all over Russia. The largest of these structures is 15 stories tall and located one hour outside of Moscow. People feeling unwell, run down, or burdened by life's responsibilities are invited to step inside the pyramid and experience the musty smelling tranquility. They are then gently guided to the gift shop, where they may purchase pebbles, mini pyramids, which Golod claims emit a calming energy rebalancing force field, and bottled water that has been stored inside the pyramid, where it is said to acquire healing properties. 
despite Galad's claims of miraculous growth and recovery within the pyramids, no scientific body has ever confirmed that the building or its trinkets confer any tangible curative effect. Next is um, Kunsta, Kunstkamera in St. Petersburg. Peter the Great, who ruled Russia from 1682 to 1725, was interested in all things modern, scientific, and rational. During his reign, when not busy ordering the interrogation, torture, and death of his own son, Peter collected artwork, scientific books and instruments, fish, reptiles, insects, and human specimens. In 1714, he ordered that his collection form the foundation of a new museum in St. Petersburg. The institution, called the Kunstkamera, was the country's first museum and aimed to show the world that Russia was a modern, scientific, secular country. Peter the Great's 300-year-old collection of human body parts is displayed on level 2 of the Kunstkamera. The focus of the collection, established in 1727, is on infant anatomy and disease, malformed fetuses, tumor-ridden stomachs, and jarred children's heads, preserved with care by 17th-century Dutch anatomist Frederick Roisch. Also on display is the skeleton of Nikolai Bourgeois, a 7-foot-2-inch man who was Peter's assistant and a living exhibit at the museum, as well as a stuffed two-headed calf and the preserved fetuses of conjoined twins. The 32 human teeth neatly arranged into a grid were all extracted by Peter the Great, who found dentistry to be a rewarding hobby. Very interesting. Now this is one I find really interesting. The Tunguska Event Epicenter in Vanavara, Krasnoyarsk Krai. On June 30th, 1908, at 7.14am, a powerful explosion shattered windows, knocked people off their feet, and leveled 80 million trees over 830 square miles of forest around Siberia's Podkamenaya Tunguska River Basin. Initial speculation was that a meteorite had hit Earth, but subsequent investigations found no crater in the area. Naturally, the mysterious nature of the Tunguska event has given rise to a wealth of conspiracy theories. Among the more far-fetched culprits, a tiny black hole passing through the Earth, a UFO crash, and the testing of Nikola Tesla's secret death ray. Today, the favored scientific explanation involves the mid-air explosion of a large meteoroid or comet. Indeed, it is the largest impact event in recent history. Split, mangled, and felled trees are still visible around the Tunguska site. Here is the Kola Superdeep Borehole in Murmansk, in the Murmansk until 1970, geologists could only theorize about the composition of the Earth's crust. That was the year Soviet scientists began drilling what would become the deepest hole in the world. Engaged in a subterranean version of the space race, the USSR went all out to beat the US in a journey to the center of the Earth. Well, American researchers faltered with Project Mohol, a dig off the coast of Mexico that ran out of funding in 1966. Their Russian counterparts took a more determined approach. From 1970 to 1994, their drill on the Kola Peninsula burrowed through layers of rock, reaching an ultimate depth of 7.5 miles. The most intriguing discovery made by the Kola borehole researchers was the detection of microscopic life forms four miles beneath the surface of the Earth. Usually, fossils can be found in limestone and silica deposits, but these microfossils were encased in organic compounds that remained surprisingly intact despite the extreme pressures and temperatures of the surrounding rock. Drilling at Kola stopped in the early 1990s, but data from the dig is still being analyzed. Next is Oymyakon, Oymyakon Saka Republic. Located just a few hundred miles from the Arctic Circle, the Siberian village of Oymyakon is the coldest permanently inhabited place on Earth. Every January, the fur swaddled citizens of Oymyakon endure average daily highs of negative 47 degrees Fahrenheit, with nighttime temperatures plummeting to around negative 60 degrees Fahrenheit. 
the lowest temperature ever recorded was negative 90 degrees Fahrenheit in 1933. Oimekon's 500 residents live on a diet of mostly reindeer and horse meat because the frozen ground makes it difficult to grow crops. Cars are hard to start because the axle grease and fuel tanks freeze and batteries lose life at an alarming speed. Summer, however, brings relief. Temperatures can even reach the 70s during July. Here is the Temple of All Religions in Kazan. Really beautiful. The colorful Temple of All Religions, or Universal Temple, is a mishmash of architectural flourishes culled from most of the major world religions. Established by philanthropist Ildar Kanov in 1992, the site is not a chapel in the traditional sense, but a center meant to stand as a symbol of religious unity. Kanov, an advocate for rehabilitation services for substance abusers, built the center with the help of patients he met through his work. The exterior of the temple looks almost like something out of Disneyland's It's a Small World ride, with a Greek Orthodox dome here and a Russian minaret there. There are design influences from Jewish synagogues and Islamic mosques, along with a number of spires and bells. All in all, the temple incorporates architectural influences from twelve religions in a bright cacophony of devotion. Really, really neat. Next is the Kostroma Moose Farm in Sumar, Sumarkovo. In the early 1930s, the USSR set its sights on spreading communism throughout the world on mooseback. Large, strong, and agile, even through deep snow, the moose seemed to be the perfect animal for the Soviet cavalry, and so began the quest to domesticate the northern moose. In secret moose husbandries, the wild animals were trained to carry armed riders and not be gun-shy. There were attempts to mount pistols and shields to the antlers of the bull moose. In the end, military moose never took off, but these taming efforts did lead to the rise of modern experimental moose farms, where semi-domesticated moose are still raised today. The early farms were tasked with raising moose for milk, transportation, and to nourish the hungry populace. Despite initial apprehension, it turned out these gentle giants were just as easily milked as cows. Hold on, my nose itches. Okay. <laughs> However, raising them for meat proved prohibitively expensive and moose, being clever creatures, wouldn't be led easily to slaughter. Despite years of brutal and bloody experimentation, it was discovered that it's difficult to make a moose do what a moose does not wish to do, and efforts to fully control them were abandoned. The Kostroma Moose Farm opened in 1963 with a new approach, known as free-range moose ranching. The tamed moose roamed the forest, but returned to the farm by choice, recognizing it as a reliable food source and safe place to give birth. The Kostromo farm started with just two calves and has since been home to over 800 moose. It's also functioned as a scientific research facility, but today the farm's primary functions are producing moose milk for medical treatments, harvesting antler velvet for pharmaceutical purposes, and providing a place for tourists to visit these fascinating creatures. Off to Serbia, we're at the Skull Tower, Nish Nishava. The Skull Tower is the grim product of the 1809 Battle of Chikar, a turning point during the first Serbian uprising against the Ottoman Empire. Des desperate in the face of certain defeat, rebel commander Stefan Schindelic fired into a gunpowder keg annihilating his entire army as well as the enemy soldiers who had flooded the trenches. Angered by Sinjelic's actions, Turkish commander Hershid Pasha ordered the mutilation of the dead rebels' bodies. Their skins were peeled off their decapitated heads, stuffed with straw, and sent to the imperial court in Istanbul as proof of Turkish victory. The 952 skulls left behind were used as building blocks for a 15-foot-tall tower constructed at the entrance of the city. Sinjelic's skull sat at the top. The gruesome construction left a deep scar in the national psyche, but did not deter its citizens from fighting for freedom from the Ottoman Empire. The Serbs rebelled again in 1815, this time successfully, 
driving off the Turks and winning independence in 1830. In the years immediately following the construction of the tower, the families of deceased rebels chiseled away some of the skulls in order to give them proper funerals. Today only 58 skulls remain. They are surrounded by hundreds of cavities, each one representing a person who died in battle. A chapel was built around the tower in 1892 to shield it from the elements. And a brief stop in Slovakia to the Chatica castle ruins in Chatica. Chatica. Beautiful. Hmm. We'll see. Four hundred years ago, Hungarian Countess Elizabeth Bathory died in a closed room inside this castle. Known as the Blood Countess, she was imprisoned for unimaginable acts, which included torturing and killing hundreds of girls, and, if the legends are to be believed, bathing in their blood. In 1610, after multiple tip-offs from locals that terrible things were happening inside Chetstitsa Castle, King Matthias II ordered the collection of testimonies and evidence, but Bathory was never convicted. In return for avoiding a trial, the family waived the king's debts. There is no way of knowing how many girls Bathory killed. Estimates of the number of victims ranged from 50 to over 600. Little is left of the building today, but there is enough to evoke the blood-soaked walls and agonized screams of Bathory's torture chambers. Off to Ukraine. Here's the Odessa catacombs in Odessa, Odessa Oblast. Rusted mining equipment, World War II grenades, 19th century wine barrels, and human remains are some of the things you might stumble upon during a journey into the labyrinthine Odessa catacombs. The estimated 1,500 miles of passage that weave beneath the streets of the city were mostly dug by limestone miners in the early 1800s. When the mines were abandoned, they quickly became the preferred hideout of rebels, criminals, and eccentrics. After the Soviets were forced out of Odessa during World War II, dozens of Ukrainian rebel groups stayed, hidden in the tunnels. While waiting for opportunities to strike, they attempted to lead normal lives, playing chess and checkers, cooking, and listening to Soviet radio. Meanwhile, the Nazis tossed poison gas canisters into the catacombs and sealed random exits, hoping to trap or smoke out the rebels. Today, only a small portion of the catacombs is open to the public as part of the Museum of Partisan Glory in Nerubyaskoya, north of Odessa. The rest of the tunnel system is structurally unstable, partially flooded, and irresistible to urban spelunkers. Groups of explorers spend days underground, bringing headlamps, waders, and backpacks full of food and wine. Occasionally, the subterranean parties turn deadly. In 2005, a group of Odessa teens spent New Year's Eve partying in the catacombs. In the drunken revelry, one of the girls became separated from the group and got lost in the catacombs. She spent three days wandering in the freezing cold and pitch black darkness before she died of dehydration. Two years later, police were finally able to locate her body and retrieve it from the depths. That's terrifying, isn't it? Next is the Balaclava submarine base in Balaclava, Crimea. I was just reading about this the other day. Balaclava, it was a quiet fishing village until 1957 when the Soviet government suddenly wiped it from official maps in order to establish a secret submarine base. Working under Stalin's orders, military engineers created Object 825 GTS, a seaside underground complex dedicated to housing and repairing naval submarines, storing weapons and fuel, and acting as a safe bunker in case of nuclear attack. Moscow subway workers spent long hours gouging out granite to build the rock-bound complex. When the four-year construction process finished in 1961, Object 825 GTS boasted a 2,000-foot-long canal capable of housing six submarines, a hospital, communication centers, food storehouses, and an ample arsenal of torpedoes, nuclear warheads, and rockets. The construction of Object 825 GTS turned Balaclava into a military town with closed borders. Residents, almost all of whom worked at the base, were not even permitted to receive visits from family members. The submarine base remained secret and operational until 1993, when post-Soviet conditions rendered it unnecessary. 
In 2004, the base opened to the public as a naval museum. The submarines are gone, but the long stone corridors, dark canals, and a few leftover missiles provide plenty of Cold War atmosphere. I think I actually watched a YouTube video about this, but I don't remember <laughs> who made it. Or else I'd link it, because I remember it being really interesting. Now here's a place that I'm desperate to go to. It's Pripyat. The Pripyat Kiev Oblast. Pripyat's clocks all read 11.55. That's the moment when on April 26, 1986, the electricity was cut following a meltdown at the Chernobyl nuclear reactor. A day later, Pripyat residents received the following evacuation announcement. For the attention of the residents of Pripyat, the city council informs you that, due to the accident at Chernobyl power station in the city of Pripyat, the radioactive conditions in the vicinity are deteriorating. Comrades, leaving your residences temporarily, please make sure you have turned the lights, electrical equipment, and water off, and shut the windows. Please keep calm and orderly in the process of this short-term evacuation. Today, Pripyat, you know, you can hear this recording on YouTube also. It's really kind of eerie. Today, Pripyat is a city of abandoned buildings with paint peeling away from the walls falling in flakes onto dusty shoes, toys, and communist propaganda posters. Outside the crumbling city center gymnasium, a rusting ferris wheel sits beside a jumble of bumper cars. They are the lone remains of a carnival that was due to open on May 1st, 1986. The somber, silent city seems an unlikely vacation spot, but it is possible to tour the Chernobyl area. A government-issued day pass is obtainable in Kiev is deemed safe to walk around Pripyat for only a few hours at a time, and several precautions must be followed to avoid contamination. Visitors must be accompanied by a tour group, and are forbidden from touching structures or placing anything on the ground within the exclusion zone. Arms, legs, and feet must be covered, and the trip ends with everyone being screened for radiation using a Geiger counter. Visitors are free to take photographs, view the reactor from a distance of 100 meters, and even talk to a few remaining residents of Pripyat, who disobeyed orders after the blast and returned to their radiation-contaminated homes. In the 30 years since Pripyat was abandoned, plants and animals have begun to thrive despite the high levels of radioactivity. Tree roots burst through concrete floors, forests encroach on the roads, and animals such as beavers, boars, wolves, and bears, long vanished from the area, have returned. Free of human influence, the area has a much greater biodiversity than it did before the disaster. Isn't it wild that, like, radiation is less dangerous than human activity for these animals? That might be, that is, the last page. So when we read more of this book, we'll visit Scandinavia. But thank you so much for watching. I hope that you found this video relaxing and educational, and I hope that you have a very good, 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 good